Sorelgar, MD. What is spondylosis? Spondylosis is a poorly understood term. Unfortunately, it's a term that will continue to be utilized by medical professionals. And what does it mean? Well, what does it literally mean? There's really two parts to the word. The first part of the word is spondylo, and that is Greek for spine. The second part of the word osis is, uh, the meaning of osis is pathologic condition. So the word literally means pathologic condition of the spine. But what does that mean? What are we talking about specifically? I'm going to try to show you the meaning of spondylosis to me. The reason I think spondylosis has existed in the terminology is because it combines a lot of different diseases into one term that is understood by radiologists, orthopedic surgeons, spine surgeons, and physiatrists. So let me talk to you about the different components of what I see in spondylosis. So here I have two MR images of the spine. These are of the lumbar spine. These are in the sagittal plane. So let me just show you, this is a normal spine here on the left, and this is a spine with spondylosis here on the right. And I'm just going to go through the normal findings here quickly and then show you what's abnormal. First thing I like to start with is the spinal column. You can see here are the vertebral bodies, and in between the vertebral bodies are these discs. And these discs are what allow you to have flexibility in your spine. These discs are juicy, uh, meaning to me that they have internal fluid here, and that's evidenced by this high signal or white signal here centrally. So that means this person can have flexibility when they flex, extend, or bend. So that's kind of the normal appearance of the vertebral column. As I move backwards, I find the spinal cord, and I find these nerve roots, which we refer to as a cauda equina, and surrounding that is this white substance, which is CSF. So this is a very sensitive, delicate structure, the spinal cord and the nerve roots. We want to be very protective of this structure. And the way we protect the structure, we surround it with bone, we surround it with posterior elements of the, of the spine, and we also surround it with CSF when we give it a lot of space uh, so that as we uh, move our body around, moving from front to back, the spine has space in which to exist. And as we keep moving backwards, we find these spinous processes. And these are, again, part of the posterior elements of the spine. They give our spine structure and support. So now let's look at the spine with spondylosis. What's the first thing I see when I'm looking at the vertebral column? The first thing I notice is that the discs are all abnormal. Look at these discs with this white signal here indicating fluid. These discs don't have that signal. That means that these discs are dried out. We would call that disc desiccation. Other thing I'm noticing is that because these discs are dried out, uh, they're now starting to bulge posteriorly. You can see that the discs here are starting to poke out posteriorly and affect the spinal canal or the central canal uh, containing the cauda equina. Other things I'm just noticing regarding the bones themselves, if you look at the end plates of the bone, or the portion of the bone right near the vertebral discs, they have these signal changes, and that indicates to me abnormal stresses on the bone, again, due to disc disease. Let's move into the uh, spinal cord and the cauda equina. I can't see the spinal cord on this image because it's just out of plane, but as we come down here to the cauda equina, we can notice that this looks very abnormal. Here we had all this white CSF signal surrounding this cauda equina. And here, that's just not the case. This is a very tight uh, central canal. You can see that at certain levels where there's a disc bulge and there's some hypertrophy of the ligament here, there's actually pinching of the cauda equina at multiple levels. We call that spinal stenosis. And you can see that could definitely result in symptoms or pain. You basically have nerve roots that are being compressed by surrounding structures. Again, not the case in normal spine, but is the case in this spine with spondylosis. Then lastly, looking at these spinous processes, I can see they're very close to one another, and they've basically lost that internal space here. So this person is going to have a lot of difficulty. Imagine this person trying to bend backwards. All these pieces of bone are going to get in the way of each other. And again, we call this Bostrop's disease, but again, it's just part of this process of degenerative change of the spine, loss of mobility, and uh, findings that would correlate with pain. All right, so now we've done kind of a uh, cross-sectional view of the spine. Here again, you can see the normal spine, a lot of CSF surrounding those nerve roots, which are floating here. So this is a perfectly normal spine here on the left. Look how abnormal this uh, spine with spondylosis is. We would call this spinal stenosis. You can see there's no CSF signal here. There's no white stuff here, so that's completely abnormal. And you can see why is that? It's being impinged upon by this 
large circumferential disc bulge. We've got these huge facet joints here, which are hypertrophied with thickening of this ligament here. So this is spondylosis. This is uh, spinal stenosis, and this is a normal spine. So again, I could describe all the findings here on this patient with spondylosis individually. I could say that there are end plate changes within the vertebral bodies. I could say there is disc disease at multiple levels. I could see there's disc bulges at multiple levels. I could say there's spinal stenosis at multiple levels, probably moderate to severe due to a combination of disc disease, facet disease, ligamentum thickening. I could talk about how tight this central canal is. I could talk about the Bostrich disease. Or I could just say in one sentence, I could say the patient has diffuse, multi-level, moderate to severe spondylosis. That's something that an orthopedic surgeon would understand. That's something a spine surgeon would understand. That's something a physiatrist would understand. And that's something that some internal medicine and family medicine doctors would understand. So that's why we use the term spondylosis. I agree it's not the best term, but I think it's a term that uh, takes into account all the different findings that are present in a degenerated pathologic spine. All right, that's it for me, SROG RMD, Diagnostic Interventional Radiology. Feel free to comment, uh, like this video if you like it, or subscribe for additional content. Thank you for watching. Struggle RMD. Take care.